Palmer had never been to Bean's house. He had been to Muddo's and Henry's, but never to Bean's. He had come to imagine that Beans lived alone. Beans never mentioned parents, brothers, sisters, or any other aspect of the family life. Palmer further imagined that Bean lived by himself in a lean-to, or even better, a cave, a hole, down by the creek. So he was surprised when Bean said, okay, to his suggestion. And even more surprised, ten minutes later, to discover Bean did not live in a lean-to or a hole after all, but in a house. And from the looks of it, a fine house with a front porch and a shiny brass doorknob. Mutto rang the doorbell, which he did whenever he approached the house, even his own, and inside could be heard a two-note ch chime. Beans took the key from the pocket and unlocked the door. He waved, he waved, come in. Inside, Palmer looked around for signs of primitive living. Mud, piles of rubbish. He saw nothing but a clean furniture, carpets, pictures on the walls, a regular house. Bean led him straight back to the kitchen. See this. Wait till you see this. He dragged a chair from the refrigerator and stood on it. He opened the freezer compartment and began pulling out frozen dinners in plastic containers. Reaching in the very back of the freezer, he pulled out a frozen dinner, jumped down on the chair, and put the dinner on the kitchen table. The lid said spaghetti with meatballs. Yummy, said Henry. I hate spaghetti, said Muto. You'll like this, said Beans. The box was bigger than the others, so-called he-man size, and he had already been opened. Palmer could tell because the lid was held by a scotch tape. Beans peeled away the tape. He seemed especially slow and careful about it. He looked up and grinned at each of them. He lifted the lid, and there was not spaghetti and meatballs. All of the visitors recoiled. Henry went, Ew! Muddle went, the first to recover, and he learned, what is it? Without warning, Bean snatched the contents of the box and popped Muto on the head. It's a muskrat. He threw it on the table. It clattered like a piece of wood. It was flat and stiff and mostly black. Palmer never in a million years would have guessed <laughs> it had once been a muskrat. Tree bark, he would have guessed. A sewer grate, floor fl flotsam. Now staring down at it with the rest of them, he noticed clotted ridges that might once have been fur and frost fr fastened along the edge. A naked tail? Where'd you get it? said Henry. Panther brought it, said Beans. Palmer boggled. You have a panther? Muto and Henry laughed. It's a cat, they said Muto. Beans shoved him. It's a panther! He bopped Muto again with the muskrat carcass, chased him once around the table and out of the kitchen. While howls and thumps rang throughout the house, tall Henry leaned in close to Palmer and softly uttered, Panther's a cat. It's the meanest cat in town. You can't pet it. It's always catching birds and mice. It bites their heads off and then brings the body to the front steps and leaves it there. Like a present. Bean says Panther even killed a deer once. <laughs> he searched Palmer's face. You believe it? Unsure, Palmer stared back. And then hurry, Hurricane swirled into the kitchen. Muto, or Muto screaming and laughing around the table. Beans waving the muskrat like a tomahawk. Suddenly, Bean stopped. He dropped the carcass on the table. Brought his hands up to the side of his face like paws and crooked fingers like claws, and he drew back his lips to show his teeth of many colors. He snarled, Panther prowls in the jungle. Panther stalks his prey. He wants, he waits, he creeps. Bean crept across the kitchen in his tiptoe. He pounces, he bites his neck. Bean pounced on Muddo's back. Muddo wobbled, howling out of the back door. Half an inch of neck and skin clamped between Outside, Palmer met Panther for the first time. The cat was ambling into the backyard from the, the weed field from beyond. Beans yelled, Panther! The cat meowed, showing its daggery teeth. It was a yellow cat, ordinary looking, no bigger than a usual cat, but Palmer noticed that no one, not even Beans, bent down to pet it as it ambled past the four of them and disappeared around the front of the house. Beans hoisting the muskrat carcass like a flag, blared, Back to fish faces, and led them 
to the sidewalk. They were crossing the street when Beans abruptly stopped. Detail halt. He wrapped his knuckles against his, the carcass. He shook his head disappointedly. We got to go back. Back to the house in the kitchen. Beans placed the carcass in the microwave. He set it on for one minute, full power. At the end of the minute, he t tested it with his finger, sniffed it, gave it another minute. By the third minute, Beans was the only one left in the kitchen. The others were outside, sucking fresh air, trying to expel from their nosebuds the odor of warm, dead muskrat. Ugh. Beans finally came out carrying the supermarket bag. On his way to Dorothy Grusick's hot beans, walked half a block ahead of the rest. When he reached Dorothy's, he sprang into action. While the others hid behind the car several houses away, Palmer could see Beans reach into the bag. When his hand had come out, he was holding the carcass by its tail. Again, he reached into the bag, this time coming out with the hammer. And the, he nailed the tail to the Grusick's front door punched the doorbell, and took off. He dived behind the car just as the door was opening. A lady, Mrs. Gruzik, appeared. None of them saw what happened next, but there was really no need to see. The screams came as they huddled against the tires of the car. Palmer had thought he knew screams. He had heard plenty of them in movies and TV and sporting events, but they had heard now was some, something else. It was real, and it sent icy buckshot through his whole body. They heard the door close. When they looked up, the carcass was gone, and Bean and, Mute and Mutto were the, on their backs, flying their arms and legs into air, howling with boundless delight. It was during the celebration of that, Mutto, looking straight up into the gray January sky, said in a voice, both dreamily and wearily from laughter, Hey, ain't that a pigeon? Beans jumped to his feet and looked. Where? Mutto pointed there. He stood. It's gone. Which way? Said Beans. Mutto pointed again. That way. Beans took off. They caught up with him in the alley. Half a mile away, he was on the hands and knees, heaving clouds of vapor. <sighs> got away, he gasped. He got to his feet, but stayed in a squat like a baseball catcher. His eyes scanned the sky, then turned to Palmer. The pigeon was flying over your house. Everyone was looking at him. Hmm, never saw any pigeon around my house, Palmer forced out a chuckle. I don't think Mutto knows what he's talking about. Probably wasn't even a pigeon. It was probably just a crow. Mutto stopped. It was a pigeon! Palmer shrugged. Even if it was, so what? It was probably flying south or something. What pigeon would ever want to stop off in this town? He laughed. A stupid pigeon, that's who, yapped Beans. They all laughed. Palmer shouted. I'm treating, I'm, I'm treating at the deli and trotted up the alley. They made sure to lead some well clear of his black backyard, later closing the door to his room behind him. Palmer broke down and sobbed. It had been a tense, uncomfortable day. The muskrat carcass, Mrs. Gruzak screamed, the pigeon sighting. Oh, he heard tapping. He opened the window and before Nipper could reach in, he grabbed him with both hands, pulled him in. The bird squirmed a little, but did not struggle to get free. Palmer ran his wet cheek along the silky feathers and then held them up. You are, stupid pigeon. Don't you know nobody around here likes you? Why didn't you pick another place to land? When Palmer set the bird down, it flew to the basketball rim and perched up there, ruffling its handled feathers and holding his head high, prim as you please, as if to say, because I like it here. From that day on, Palmer became even more attached to this pi his pigeon. Sometime after school, he would sneak out with the crowd, pass the guys, and run home a different way to get there before Nipper. Once he and Nip Nipper had arrived the same time, and Palmer, dashing up his backyard, suddenly felt a familiar feet upon, feet upon his head. He wondered where Nipper went during the day. Did he fly around town, oblivious to the danger? Did he go to the park, steer clear of the soccer field? Did he fly to the other towns? For Nipper's sake, Palmer knew he should what he should wish. He should wish that Nipper would find another boy in another town, a town that would not run screaming after him, 
a town that would not hate him and would not shoot him. But Palmer could not bring himself to make that wish. Sometimes when he let Nipper out of the morning, he would watch the bird eat breakfast out on the porch roof. When finished, Nipper would walk to the front of the edge of the roof, step onto the upturned lip on the rain spout, and with a chuckle, take off. But he would not fly straight away. He would soar up and circle the house once more, sometimes twice. The library book had said, Pigeons do this in order to fix their mind's compass, the place where it must return to. Palmer preferred to think the bird was reluctant to leave. In any case, Nipper then flew off and was quickly out of sight. He was never clumsy outside of Palmer's foot of room, although the days that followed, the guys talked and laughed about the muskrat carcass and Mrs. Gruziak's scream. They stayed away from Dorothy's house for a while, but not from Dorothy. They continued to snowball, tree stump, and otherwise torment her the way to and from school. Palmer kept expecting consequences. He thought maybe her parents would show up at his front door, or the principal would announce that they were all suspended, or Dorothy herself would blow her top. When something finally did happen, it wasn't what Palmer expected. Tree stumping had become popular among other school kids. Other boys, noticing the fu what fun Palmer LaRue was having, his friends were having, decided it was something they could play too. So they began picking out girls to tree stump to and from school. Occasionally tree stump got swatted by a girl's book bag. But for the mo most part, girls also found it to be fun. And before long, they were tree stumping the boys. Dorothy Gruzek, of course, being the exception. Beans began to notice for a while it had been enough just to bother Dorothy Gruzek, enough to just hear her the laughter to himself with his pals. Now he wanted more. He wanted something from Dorothy. He wanted her to scream or laugh or cry or kick or sling a book bag or even scowl. A good scowl that would do for starters anything but ignore him. For that's what Dorothy did, except to walk around them when they planted themselves in front of her to say in no way acknowledge their existence. She did not even look at them. One day after school, determined to change this, Beans ordered the guys to meet her right at school, the doorway to the entry stumper. If necessary, even step of the way, uh, the, the, every step of the way to her own front door. And they did. Not once did she look at them. Nor did she make it harder for them. She could have taken shortcuts through people's yards. She could have gone to the store here, a friend's house there. But she did not. Beans began to move. Instead of just standing stiff, stump-like, in front of her, he wagged his arms and legs. He rolled his eyes and wiggled his ears and stretched out his lips to show every one of his multicolored teeth. He grunted. He bellowed. He snorted. Just plain screamed in her face. He scooped plastic spoonful of baked beans from a can and dumped them on, in, onto her shoe. The guys and the other kids howled with laughter. Palmer's stomach hurt. He laughed so hard. That beans. He took the puppet on the strings, herky-jerking it from Dorothy, his head wobbling, even his ankles. What a clown. Dorothy never flinched. She never looked. On a windy day, beans wait, swatted her books away, making papers fly, so she had to go chasing them. Another day, he snatched away her floppy red hat and put it on his own head and did not a goofy flailing dance in front of her. The sidewalk erupted with laughter. Even passing cars slowed down. Dorothy did not crack a smile. She did not step aside. She did not step back, and she did nothing. She did not even leave. She did not even leave the hat at the home the next day. In the following days, Bean zeroed in on her, the hat. He sent it flying across the street. He tossed it into a dumpster. He hung it from a car's antenna. He tacked it to the telephone pole. He wiped a window with it. For Motto, Henry, and Palmer, who by now were strictly spectators, this was a daily after-school show. Each morning, the hat was a little grayer and less red and just as firmly on Dorothy's head. Motto said in amazement, I think she likes torture. 
beans smoldered. The last thing Beans did was the simplest of all. It happened on a Friday afternoon. As usual, he intercepted Dorothy on the way home. But this time, he did not only step in front of her, he closed in. He closed in until there was barely a paper's width between their noses. No monkey shines this time. No funny faces. His jaw hard, his eyes burning. He stared unblinkingly into the eyes a mere inch away and dared her not to see him dared her not to smell his baked bean breath. All movements of, la of laughter on the sidewalk stopped. The boys and girls stood, like for what seemed hours, so close at the distance it seemed that they might be kissing. And to those nearby, finally Beans himself made it clear, even now, even this close, still, still, she would not look at him. And then she did it. She spoke. But the person she spoke to was not Beans. It was Palmer LaRue. She took one step back from Beans, walked straight over to Palmer, and stood squarely in front of him and said, Why are you doing this to me? And just like that, the girl in the red coat, floppy hat, was no longer a target. She was Dorothy. And there were tears in her eyes. And she was saying to him, not to anyone else, but to him, to Palmer, why are you doing this to me? And he knew that through the last weeks she had been seen hurting after all, and that it had been himself, not Beans, who had hurt her. Not bothering to wipe her eyes and walked home. The next day, N Nipper failed to return. As usual, the first thing Palmer did after closing the door was to look to the window, usually. What he saw was Nipper's silhouette, a clear black cutout on the golden sunlit shade. This time, there was only the shade, like empty movie screen. Well, it happened before. Sometimes Palmer was the first to get home. He shot baskets with his Nerf ball, glancing at the window after every shot, listening for taps on the pane. With every passing moment, he became convinced something was wrong. This was not an ordinary delay. In a way... More it felt than, than he thought. He sensed the connection between Nipper's absence and Dorothy's words, which had been haunting him without let up. He raised the shade, raised the window, look out, no Nipper, not on the roof, not in the sky, and the sun was behind the houses. Nipper had never been this late before. He shot baskets. He searched the sky. He watched the clock. Cooking smells drifted up to his room. Daylight faded. His mother called, Palmer, dinner! He pounded his fist in the windowsill. He kicked his bed. Tears came. He told his parents he had watched the news for a school project and got permission to take his dinner to his room. But he could not eat. He could not do anything but wait and watch and listen and try to forget how useless waiting was, for he knew that no pigeon flies after sundown. And wherever Nipper was, he was there for the night. And where could that be? Had he gotten lost? Found another pigeon? Another human friend? Was he roosting warmly in another closet in another town? Or on a road somewhere? Crushed? Uh, nothing of him moving except a wing waving with every passing tire? Had Panther the yellow cat got a hold of him? He pounded his fist onto his thighs and squeaked in frustration. He wanted to do something, but what? What do you do when your pigeon does not come home? So he went out to the backyard, stood in the cold, and looked up and softly called, Nipper, Nipper. A world of stars. Darkness gave no reply. In the den, he whispered in the golden bird, Where's my pigeon? The golden bird was silent. He did not go to sleep that night. Instead, sleep snuck up or sneaked up on him. And the next thing he knew, he was dreaming and tapping a cruel dream of a pigeon tapping on the window. Only it wasn't, it wasn't a dream, for his room was filled with daylight pouring under the raised shade. And there was Nipper pecking on the pane. When Palmer opened the window, Nipper, as usual, hopped on his head bent down and gave the ear an especially ouchy nip, as if to say, Who said you could wake up without me? No Christmas morning was ever happier than that one. It was Saturday. 
so the two could play as long as they wished. Palmer kept the bird in his room until noon. By that time, Nipper was knocking on the window, clearly wanting to go out. Palmer hated to let him go, but he knew he must. As he opened the window and watched Nipper fly off, he knew something else. He could no longer bear this alone. He ha it had to be shared. Why are you doing this to me? He dashed down the stairs, out the door, and across the street, coatless and feeling the cold. He knocked on the door. He pressed the doorbell. Inside, he heard footsteps and a voice calling, I'll get it. The door opened. Warmth and light washed over him. She smiled. She was glad to see him. She did not wait another moment, he said. I have a pigeon. <laughs>